teaching affiliate and researcher for the English Place Name Society in the School of English here. But as of January, she's going to be lecturer in English Language and Linguistics at the University of Glasgow. Um, she's worked... <laughs> um, the English Place Name Society, she's worked on the volumes for Cornwall and Staffordshire Place Names and co-edits the Journal of the English Place Name Society. Her research is on Nottinghamshire field names, and her PhD focused on field names in Thurgot and Wapentake. Um, she's particularly interested in Scandinavian influence on field name vocabulary, and what that can tell us about Viking settlement and integration in the county. Uh, she's also the author of the recently published Viking Nottinghamshire, copies on sale in the museum shop and she will be doing a book signing afterwards if you want to get to her and get her to sign it for you um, and that will be in the atrium and I'll also say that after the lecture there will be a handling session of original artifacts in the museum and we will have reproduction <coughs> artifacts um, for handling in the atrium next to the book signing so without further ado Dr. Rebecca Gregory. Thank you very much. I think that's the biggest round of applause I've ever had. <laughs> Is my microphone working? Can you all hear yes, me? Sir. Okay, I'm a little bit croaky, so I'm going to do my best. But just wave at me if I'm going, going to do, as it were. <clears throat> okay, so thank you very much for coming. Um, and before I actually dive into East Midlands place names, um, I'm just going to take a few minutes first to give you um, a bit of background to make sure that we're kind of all up to speed, both in terms of the historical context of the period that we're looking at today, and in terms of how place names work as well, because you may not be familiar with them as a historical source. Um, so think of this as a kind of five minute crash course, if you know it all already, you can sit there and feel smug, or you <laughs> probably don't snore, but other than that, it's kind of up to you. Um, so the focus of this lecture is going to be not just, you know, here are some place names that have Viking origins. I could do that quite easily, but that wouldn't be very interesting, I don't think. It wouldn't be worth your time. Um, so hopefully what I'm going to do instead um, is to start showing how place names actually add to the picture of what we know about Viking settlement in the East Midlands. So... <clears throat> Oh, it works, excellent. So from the 5th century onwards, roughly speaking, um, England was settled, as I'm sure you know, by groups of people from continental Europe, generally referred to as the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and over the next few centuries, Anglo-Saxon kingdoms developed. Um, and this map shows roughly how the country was looking in about 800 AD. Um, and as you can hopefully see, the East Midlands that we're concerned with today um, fell into the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Mercia, that great big one in the middle. Um, and from the late 8th century, Viking raids began on coastal Britain. Um, and in the 9th century, um, we had an invasion proper. So a fighting force, often referred to as the Great Heathen Army, uh, landed in East Anglia in 865. And they marauded their way, basically, around much of eastern England uh, before they met their match, eventually, at the Battle of Eddington in 878, when uh, King Alfred of Wessex defeated the Viking army there. <coughs> So the Vikings retreated, uh, and their leader, Guthrum, uh, struck up a peace treaty with King Alfred. And as a result of that treaty, two very important things happened. Uh, so firstly, Guthrum, the leader, was baptised as a Christian, and that began the whole process of conversion amongst the Vikings in England. But more relevant to our focus today um, is that an area of England was actually set aside to be ruled by the Vikings, and that's what we kind of come to know as the Dane law. So the Dane law looked something like this. So that whole area shaded in purple in the north and the east of England. And in the years that followed, five of the key boroughs or fortifications in the Dane law were formed into a confederation. 
And those boroughs were Nottingham, Derby, Leicester, Lincoln, and Stamford. And this is the first sort of administrative unit that begins to look something very much like the modern East Midlands. So that's an extremely kind of broad brush version um, of the historical context for you. Um, so we have an area of England given over for Scandinavian rule and settlement. Um, and we have the five boroughs looking quite like the East Midlands. Viking rule in the Dane law didn't strictly last forever so long. So Edward the Elder, an English king, uh, retook it for the English in the early 10th <coughs> century. But nevertheless, this area continued to be identified as different from the rest of England. So place names. How are place names actually relevant to this period in English history and in East Midlands history, more importantly? Um, well, I'm hoping that I won't have to work too hard to convince you that they are interesting because you're all here. I've got a captive audience. Um, but I'm going to borrow Matthew Townend's words, actually, because he puts this far better than I can. And what he says is that, oh, excuse me, place name study has done as much as any discipline uh, to bring us knowledge about the Scandinavian episode in England's past. And he says the history of the Dane law would be unwritable without it. Okay, but why? Why are place names such useful historical evidence? Well, for a start, they're everywhere. There's no other kind of evidence which is found in such abundance in so many places. They started out as descriptive labels. So they tell us something very particular about a place or about its people, its resources, at the time that that name was coined and first used. Those labels had to be useful. So they were given using words that people would have understood, essentially. They preserved the language used by normal people in their everyday lives. And that's the kind of information that you don't often get in documentary sources. So they fill a huge hole in the evidence that we have for the early medieval period. To a great extent, then, the languages used in place names will reflect the language used by the local people. So Anglo-Saxon place names were given in Old English, the language that the Anglo-Saxons spoke, while Viking place names were generally given in Old Norse, their language. So when I talk about Old English, I'm talking Anglo-Saxon. When I talk Old Norse or Norse, I'm talking about Vikings, Scandinavians. So here's a very well-known map, to some of you, I'm sure, of place name distribution. These are all the parish names in England which appear to have an Old Norse, so a Viking origin. And that thick black line that cuts partway through the country, that's roughly the southern boundary of the Dane law. And so what appears to be going on is that Old Norse names are found in the places where documentary evidence tells us that Vikings settled. Easy peasy, job done, we can go home. <laughs> but of course, it's not quite that simple. So arguments have gone back and forth over the years about what Old Norse place names actually signify. Some people have suggested that a few Viking military or aristocratic leaders might have just come in and changed place names when they took over. Or that the Anglo-Saxons just followed Viking fashion and started naming places using Norse words instead of English ones. There's been a bit of an obsession with numbers as well. How many Vikings were there? How many phases of settlements? How many villages were Anglo-Saxon? How many were Viking? And I'm not sure how many friends I'm going to make myself here, but what I'm going to say is that that doesn't matter, not for our purposes today. We can look at the effect that Viking settlement had on the East Midlands and East Midlands place names without knowing how many Vikings there actually were. So we can think about language, we can think about culture, about influence, without having to think about numbers in any strict sense at all. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to think about some of the more nuanced ways that we can use place names. So here are a few things you need to know, and bear with me here. Number one, names change over time. That might sound really obvious, um, but if you look at the modern spelling or use the modern pronunciation of a name, it might bear very little resemblance to that name's original form or its original meaning. So to use place name material, we have to look for the oldest spellings that are closest to the original forms. And because we're working with names that might be well over a thousand years old, and many of them are, the written records that we have for that period are scarce. So 
Although an Anglo-Saxon settlement might have been founded in, say, the 7th century, we might not have a written record of it for another 400 years. Many place names in England are first recorded in the Doomsday Book, uh, which is a survey undertaken in the late 11th century on behalf of William the Conqueror. So even with the oldest written forms, there can still be some kind of educated guesswork needed. And thankfully, there are some excellent place name dictionaries that have done all that work for us. So <laughs> to look at place names yourself, you don't have to do all that kind of legwork. Um, so I'm just going to use one local example just to illustrate this point. So Attenborough, just down the road from us now, um, was first recorded in the 12th century. So it's a little bit later than many place names are recorded. And it has a whole run of different spellings after that date. And these are in chronological order, column to column. <clears throat> now, the first time we see it with its modern spelling, as we would recognise it, isn't until 1637. So that's about 500 years after the first written record that we have. And even longer after the place was certainly first named. <coughs> so I'm not going to talk you through all the different variations. Uh, but in general, that you, you can see that in the earliest spellings, we've got a D instead of a T. Um, we've got an I rather than an E in that second syllable, um, although the, the way that's kind of represented in the spelling seems to change a little bit through time. And it's actually only really, really late that we get this T coming in and we get a recognisable Attenborough. So by using those early forms, place name researchers can tell that the name was originally made up of three separate words or elements. So Ada is a man's name. Ing is a kind of connective word that implies association or ownership. Um, and Burg means a fortification. And that's the same word that you get coming through in many modern names that end in borough, for example. Now, in the case of Attenborough, the name's actually referring to a church and not a sort of defensive fortification. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see how those early spellings are much, much more useful in working out where this name comes from, what significance it has, what it can tell us. <clears throat> and in fact, in the case of this particular name, all the words in it are in Old English, the Anglo-Saxon language. So <clears throat> although we've said that place names are generally given in the language that people are speaking um, in their day-to-day -day lives, they can in fact be made up of more than one language. Now, this can happen for a number of reasons. So sometimes words can be added to pre-existing names for extra clarification. So um, for East and West Leek, for example, in Nottinghamshire, they were both originally just called Leek, which is from the Old Norse word for a stream. Um, and English, East and West have been added to those to distinguish one from another. You can see how that's more useful. Sometimes we can see these developments in the written record. We have an original spelling without these additions, but often they took place before the names were ever written down. Sometimes parts of a name could be replaced by a word from another language. Um, and sometimes words were borrowed from one language into another and then used in names. So if I were to call my house Brook Villa, for example, that doesn't mean I speak Spanish or Italian or any other language that uses the word villa. It just means that I happen to know what that word means. I've decided to use it for my own particular purpose and reason. So we have to be careful with place names and with languages. And rather than making conclusions based on one individual name and its meaning, it can be much more helpful to look at patterns of names and what they might indicate. And that's what we're going to be doing today not picking apart individual names, but looking at some of these patterns and what they tell us about history. So broadly speaking, our questions are, what patterns can we see in Old Norse, in Viking names in the East Midlands? And what does that actually tell us about Vikings and Viking settlement? So I thought we'd start with some of the Old Norse vocabulary that's easier to recognise in modern names, just to give you a sense of quite how abundant this vocabulary actually is in place names that you'll all be familiar with. So Old Norse bu is the most common, and this comes through in place names ending by, b. It means something like settlement, and it, it's found as the final word, final element in place names. A thorpe 
is a secondary or a dependent settlement. Um, and there are many of these too. So Thorpe on the Hill in Lincolnshire is one example. And this is an illustration of exactly that previous point. There are so many Thorpes that Thorpe on the Hill is much easier to distinguish than just any old Thorpe. A Beck is from Old Norse as well. Um, and this is a word which, of course, has been thoroughly absorbed into Northern English um, and Scots dialects as well, as a word for a stream. But in older settlement names, like uh, Maplebeck in Nottinghamshire, it hasn't yet become an English dialect word in the same way. A home can be roughly translated as an island, um, either in the sense of raised, drier ground in kind of marshy waterdog land, so land essentially suitable for putting your village on, um, or land almost completely surrounded by water. And this is Home Pierpont in Nottinghamshire. In fact, it's Home Lane in Home Pierpont, um, looking suitably soggy, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, and the Old Norse word for valley, which you'll probably recognise, um, that can be used at either the beginning or the end of a place name. Um, I had to use this photo because not only do we have Great and Little Dolby, um, but we also have Moscow in Leicestershire. <laughs> Your guess is frankly as good as mine. Um, and then we have names in Lund or Lound, which is the word for a grove or a wood. Um, Sutton come Lound is one of these. Used to be two separate settlements and they're treated as one for administrative purposes. So I imagine you can think of many, many more examples just off the top of your head um, using these elements without trying particularly hard. Um, which should give you some idea of just how many Old Norse words have made it into East Midlands place names, whether we recognise them as such or not. Um, and we're going to come back to several of these place name elements in a moment. But in fact, the first pattern that I want to look at actually contains an Old English word, not an Old Norse one. Um, so these place names I'm going to talk about are known as totem hybrids. Don't worry too much about the terminology. Um, but they are named from Toten in Nottinghamshire. Um, and they are made up of the Old English word toon, meaning settlement, um, along with a Scandinavian personal name, which you can see is the case in Toten. So part of the name is in the Anglo-Saxon language, and part of it seems to be Viking. And there are a whole host of these names in the East Midlands. So this table shows you all the different personal names, people's names, in bold, with the place names that they're found in given underneath. Um, I should say that some of these are almost certain, we're sure about the etymology, some of them are less clear. Um, but what you'll hopefully be able to see in either case is that there's very little repetition, actually. So it's not that one Viking name is being used again and again in a dozen settlements. Um, we've got a whole variety of names and therefore people being represented here. So this is a pattern of names which begs some particular questions, I think. So firstly, who were all the people we've just seen who are referred to in those place names? Well, what we do know about them is that they had Scandinavian names. That doesn't necessarily mean that they were Vikings, but with such a strong pattern and such a trend towards these Viking names, I think it's a fairly safe bet to say that most of them were. And we also know that they were important enough people, for whatever reason, to be commemorated in the names of settlements, and for those names to stick. And although there's been a lot of debate on this subject, which I won't go into, it seems likely that these were some of the first Viking settlers in the East Midlands, perhaps even members of the great heathen army after they split up and started taking ownership of land and of settlements. Their names in the place names do seem to indicate ownership or certainly authority of some sort. But who was actually doing the naming? Did these men just name the villages after themselves? Um, there are several options here as well. Um, so it's possible that new landlords simply replaced part of an existing village name with their own name, a kind of marker of ownership, stamping their identity on their new territory. It's also possible that English speakers, so using Old English, <laughs> named the places in their own language, hence the Old English word toon being used rather than Old Norse word, but that they were also referring to these new landlords. Another option 
is that the word tune was actually adopted by the Viking settlers to refer to an English village, which they'd taken over. Now, there was an almost identical word, tune, in Old Norse, but it wasn't really used in Danish place names. So it doesn't seem too much of a stretch to think that this easily understandable, recognisable word might have been adopted. So what might that actually tell us about these places named as Houghton hybrids? Well, if the place names are the names of members of the Viking army, or certainly important Scandinavians, then these look like potentially some of the first places Scandinavians settled, or at least took over, in the late 9th century. It also seems like, whatever you think about that topic, there's a conscious use of a name type, a name formation, um, to mark these places out in some way. And that does fit nicely with the idea that they're newly taken over by Scandinavians, so that would be administratively important. So that's one group of place names that seems to represent potentially a particular phase in Viking settlement. Um, and I want to think next about names in Old Norse bu. So this word has essentially the same meaning um, as Old English tune that we've just been thinking about, um, but in the language of the Vikings this time, in Old Norse. And again, we can think about the same kinds of questions. So who's giving the names? What do they tell us? Why might they be significant if they are significant? So some things we do already know about these names. <coughs> Firstly, boo is much more likely to be used in a place name alongside other Old Norse words rather than Old English ones, so entirely in the Viking language. So it doesn't look like it's a word that's being borrowed by English speakers and using, used for their, kind of, their own purposes. About half the boo names uh, contain a personal name, the name of a person. And these are overwhelmingly Old Norse as well. So this tells the same story. And it looks essentially like most of these boo names are being coined in an Old Norse linguistic context. In other words, in an environment, in a community where Norse is a language of choice. And we can reasonably assume, I think, that a Norse-speaking community is a Viking community of sorts. So that's what the language is telling us, but what about the landscape? Well, that also tells a story of new Scandinavian settlements, fitting in potentially around Anglo-Saxon ones. Now, Kenneth Cameron's pioneering work in the 1960s and afterwards demonstrated a difference in the location of Viking named settlements from Anglo-Saxon ones. And he showed that, in general, Anglo-Saxon settlements occupied the most desirable locations, so on well-drained soil within close proximity to fertile land for farming, um, and that Scandinavian named settlements were in slightly less desirable places, so they might be on more waterlogged ground or further away from that ideal farmland. Um, so to illustrate this, here's one of Cameron's maps uh, for Alford in Lincolnshire. The map came up after the blobs, which really wasn't particularly helpful, I realise. <laughs> there will be more blobs in a moment. Um, so, the dotted areas, kind of in the middle of the map, if you can make those out, they're areas of gravel. So they're this really well-drained ground that's suitable for building a settlement on. The area that looks like brickwork in the bottom left, that's chalk. So again, we've not got particular drainage problems there. Most of the rest of the map, with this kind of striped effect on it, that's all clay. So clay's great for farming. It's heavy, but it's fertile. Um, so you want access to that land, but you don't necessarily want to be building on it. So what we've got are these blue blobs, and they are English settlements, or English named settlements, I should say. So Alford, in the middle, that's smack bang on a nice patch of gravel. It's at the, near the edge of the patch of gravel, so it's got access to this clay land, um, but it's on that gravel. Well, at the bottom there, that's on chalk, again, near that edge, so it's got access to the clay. If we then look at the names in Boo, <coughs> these red ones here, they're in quite different positions. So Rigsby doesn't do too badly. That's the other one on the edge of the chalk at the bottom there. So that, that's in quite a reasonable position. Um, but the other settlements do show signs of being pushed onto less favourable land. 
Um, so ALB and TOTHB in the middle, they're just kind of on the edge of that gravel patch. You can see where they want to be, but they're kind of being pushed off. Um, SAILB, uh, that's further towards the top. I assume that's actually north. There's not a marker on there. On a very small patch of gravel, you can see what they've done there, but it's not in such a prime position as Alfred. Uh, Alfred excuse me. And the other three, B's B, Mark B and Bill's B, they're firmly on that clay, on that really poorly draining land. So you can kind of see the effect here, can't you? I think this perfectly illustrates Cameron's point that what we seem to have are a kind of further set of settlements that are fitting in around those English named ones. And it is tempting to think, yes, we've got Scandinavians coming in and they're building new villages. I wanted to look at a couple of these boo names in detail, or some boo names in detail, I should say. Um, and I settled on Aisby, near Sleaford in Lincolnshire. Um, and then I stumbled across this photo. Um, believe it or not, it did happen in that order. Um, of a signpost near Aisby with not one but five boo names on it. Um, so we have Aisby, Osby, Welby, Ornsby and Swarby on this one signpost. Um, and if I show you a map of where it is, you've got not only those five boo names, but then you also have Osbornby, Silk Willoughby, kind of falling off the top of the map. Uh, we've got Kelby, Dembleby, Aswaby, Spanby, I'm probably pronouncing some of these wrong, so if you're a Lincolnshire native, please forgive me. Um, we also have a Thorpe in Culverthorpe. Remember, we've seen Thorpes. Um, and we have two Becks as well, north and south. So if I'd tried to find a Scandinavian bit of Lincolnshire, I probably couldn't have done any better. Um, it wasn't calculated, I promise. Um, anyway, that's Aisby. Um, and the arrow points to just about where the photograph was taken, just to give you a sense of the landscape. So what can we say about the five names on this sign? Well, we know that personal names are often found in Boo. We said they were about half of cases. So we'd expect at least one, probably more, of these names to contain personal names. So Aisby does, Osby probably does, Ornsby might, Swarby probably does too. So up to four out of our five names fit the stereotype, essentially. They contain personal names, or might contain personal names. Um, and in fact, one of them preserves a rare personal name as well. Um, Ornsby might instead contain an Old Norse normal vocabulary word rather than a personal name, which means something like wasteland. Um, so these four names essentially seem to conform to that Scandinavian linguistic context that we were suggesting a few minutes ago. So they're made up entirely of either Old Norse words or names um, and were therefore probably given by speakers of Old Norse. Welby's the odd one out. So it comes from an Old English word, weller, meaning a stream or a spring. Um, now this name, as we've said, could have been formed in a number of ways. Um, so it could have been an Old English name originally that's been partly renamed. Um, it could have been an entirely Old Norse name that's then been replaced with an Old English word. Or it could have been formed from words in two different languages originally. That's perfectly possible. So maybe Old Norse speakers adopted the word Wella, but maybe Old English speakers started using the word Bu. Now, the latter option, I think, is maybe more likely, because we've got Bu, as you can see, as such a common naming element in this area that it's not difficult to see how that might just become part of the local kind of naming vocabulary, naming dialect, that sort of thing. We can't be sure, we don't have any early spellings that might tell us that, but we've got a combination of the two different languages in that name there. Now in the East Midlands, we've got a few examples of this kind of linguistic replacement taking place, where an element from one language is replaced by an element from another language. Bleasby in Nottinghamshire is first recorded as Bleasdtoon with uh, Old English tune. But a century later, it appears to be a name in Bu. Um, now, the first element in the name is interesting because that appears to be Old Norse. It's either a personal name or a normal vocabulary word. Um, so it's possible that the name did actually start as a kind of fully Scandinavian compound um, and that tune's been sort of used there and alternated with Bu. We can't know. But it's certainly an interesting example. Uh, one of the Norman bees in Lincolnshire, there are a few Norman bees, 
uh, appears to have originally had an Old English name. Um, so Northman, which is the first element in this name, um, is an Old English word for Norwegian or Norwegian Viking. So that's being used to distinguish people in this place from, from the Danes, who were more usual in the East Midlands. Um, Stowe, which is in that first <coughs> spelling you can see, is an Old English word. It means a place, sometimes an assembly place, holy place, something special, potentially. Um, and in 1086, we have examples of Norman Stowe and Norman B. So we have both these names apparently being used at the same date, which is a little bit peculiar. But as you can see, what we've got is the Old Norse element winning out. We end up with a boo. We've got a Norman B, not a Norman Tun in this case, or a Norman Stowe, I should say, in fact. Now, Derby is possibly the most complicated example. I did think twice about including Derby, but you can't not include Derby. So the larger a settlement is, as a general rule, uh, the less likely it is that a name will be changed. More people know it, more people use it, it's less subject to change. That makes sense. So for an important town such as Derby, which is, you know, we know it becomes one of those five boroughs, to have a new name is really interesting. So the Anglo-Saxons called the town Northworthy, Northern Enclosure. But the Viking name is completely different. So the Vikings used the name something like Derby which in Norse means deer settlement. So at first glance, there's no clear reason for this change. There's no real similarities between the Old Norse and the Old English. It's not a partial replacement. It's not even a translation. Um, it looks like a wholesale renaming, essentially. Um, but actually, the Vikings may well have been influenced by a previous name which was used by the Romano-British population, so pre-Anglo-Saxon. Now, they used the name of the River Derwent, which, of course, flows through Derby, um, to refer to the settlement there, um, which they called Derventio. And that name seems to have been recognised in some way, reinterpreted as a Norse name by the Viking settlers, and has led to them using this Norse name, which became Derby. Um, clearly, there are some really complex processes going on here with naming, renaming, subject to all kinds of considerations. Um, but yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't not show you that one. So, broadly speaking, these Boo names, they're generally Viking names, generally given by speakers of Old Norse. But there are, of course, exceptions to the rule. The word boo might sometimes have been used by speakers of Old English, especially in areas where lots of boo names already existed. Um, and if this is the case, it shows that Old Norse language was influencing the way that speakers of Old English named their own homes. We've got influence of one language on another. Boo could also replace Old English words in some names, as we've seen. Um, so it seems to have fulfilled several different roles, um, you know, potentially widening its remit after the Viking settlement after speakers of the different languages had more chance to integrate and to communicate. The last pattern of names I want to talk about is Thorps. Again, there are lots of these in the East Midlands. I've said that already. And detailed research on this type of name again means that we know some key things about them. So Thorps are secondary or dependent settlements. And it seems as though they could be named in relation to places with either Old Norse or Old English names themselves. They're strongly associated with areas of England where, uh, which were, sorry, where the soil is most suitable for arable farming. So that might suggest a phase of new settlements with a kind of arable farming function. We know that the vast majority of Thorpes have never got bigger than villages. And villages named with Thorpe are much more likely to have been deserted in the medieval period uh, than names with other elements. Now, there was an old English word, throp, um, which, as I'm sure you can imagine, could be easily confused uh, with Old Norse Thorpe, either in reality or in the documentary record that we have. And that's led some people to argue that Thorpe names aren't really Scandinavian at all. They're just Old English. But like Booze, about half of early Thorpe names probably contain a personal name. And about half of those personal names 
or Scandinavian. As we said already, you don't need to be of Scandinavian descent to have a Viking name, but a proportion that are high still looks quite Viking. And just to demonstrate that Thorpes are generally these small places with a propensity to disappear, um, here are some statistics. So this chart is taken from an excellent book called Thorpes in a Changing Landscape. Um, and it gives the percentage of names in the East Midlands containing different elements that disappear. So they were recorded before 1500 and are now lost. And as you can see, Thorpe is a clear winner on the right hand side there. So one such example is Gainsthorpe in Lincolnshire. So its name means secondary settlement belonging to Gamel. Gamel being um, a Scandinavian personal name. And the site of Gainsthorpe is now managed by English Heritage, so you can go and have a stomp around it for free should you feel so inclined, get your wellies on. Um, and you can see on this photo just about, you can see the sunken trackway where the village was um, and the lumps and bumps in the field that are all that remains of building foundations there. The village here was probably abandoned in the 14th century, as many were, um, and we still don't fully understand the reasons that this took place. So those are three major patterns of place naming in the East Midlands, just three. There are more, which tell us something about Viking settlement. So the first and probably the earliest are the Toten, Toten hybrids which might give us the names of some of the first Viking settlers, perhaps military leaders, who came and claimed land in the East Midlands. The Boo names probably come a little bit later, uh, and they were coined in an environment where Old Norse was spoken by enough people for place names in that language to be useful descriptive labels. In other words, while the Toten hybrids don't necessarily point to more than a few Viking settlers, the Boo names seem to suggest a denser settlement. I promised I wouldn't talk about numbers, I'm just saying denser. <laughs> they seem often to have been new place names, especially when their locations are taken into account, but they also have really interesting relationships with pre-existing English names as well. The final group of place names, the Thorpes, they tend to name less significant places, uh, and they're more prone to disappearing than any other group. They do, in their early incarnations at least, have a strong association with Scandinavian personal names. So it's quite possible <laughs> that Viking settlers using the word Thorpe influenced English speakers to start using the word themselves. So just like Vikings possibly starting to use the word Tune because it was common amongst English place names, use of the English word Throp likely increased due to Scandinavian influence. And so the two, no, two words are kind of almost indistinguishable now in the place name record. So from just three kinds of names, we have potential evidence for individual settlers, uh, for groups of settlers speaking Old Norse in the East Midlands, and for the influence of Viking naming patterns on the English population as well. And the last thing I want to do is talk about homes. I should really, shouldn't I? And I want to talk about what happens to an Old Norse word once it's adopted in England, in what you'd call an Anglo-Scandinavian context, following the Viking settlement and integration. So names in home in England, they come from that Old Norse word I mentioned earlier, indicating raised ground in marsh or a place almost surrounded by water, a kind of island, but in these two different senses. So there are 11 settlement names in the East Midlands which contain this word and are recorded before 1150. So 11 homes that we know to be early. Um, all but one of these is wholly Old Norse. Um, killing home is the exception in which home probably replaced an earlier Old English word. And by 1500 we have another 14 recorded as well. And they may be much older, it just depends when we have those records from. Now it's not possible to tell of course from a written record um, which precise meaning the word had, whether it was is this dry ground in a marsh, whether it was surrounded by water proper. Um, and to do that, you have to look at the landscape, either on a map or on the ground. Um, so this is Broadhome in Lincolnshire, uh, which contains a Scandinavian personal name. Um, so you can see on the map, it doesn't appear to be surrounded by water. The landscape can, of course, change a great deal uh, between the medieval period and modern maps. 
um, but it doesn't appear that that would have been the case. So is it marshy? Um, well, like many places, there are well-constructed drains now, and this is particularly the case in part of Lincolnshire, um, where areas have been drained. But I don't think this is hard to imagine as a boggy landscape. Um, artist's impression, possibly. Um, Brock's home, also in Lincolnshire. <laughs> That gives us a clue in the name. So it's probably from an old Danish word that means marsh. Um, it's near the River Till, which you can hopefully see flowing through the map there. Um, and again, if you look at a photograph, it doesn't take much imagination to see marshland, I don't think. With Flaxholm in Derbyshire, this is a slightly later example. It's not recorded until the 13th century. Um, and it's more difficult to tell which sense is appropriate here. So, the course of the river, from what I can tell, um, looks to have been artificially altered. So we can't really know, um, certainly from modern maps, which sense might have been more appropriate. Um, so this is, is the way this word is used in settlement names. Um, and it's a word which was absorbed into English to the extent that it was used in place names in areas far away from documented uh, Scandinavian settlement. So what happens to the meaning of a word and the way a word is used when this happens? Um, and in the case of home, it gets used in a slightly different way as we move a little bit later and as we move to a bit of a different type of name. Um, because the names that we have recorded later are often what we call minor <coughs> place names. And they are the names of smaller landscape features. So it can be things like, you know, hills, woodlands, uh, fields, anything of kind of local significance, but not settlement names. So this modern map, this shows the River Trent in northeast Nottinghamshire up towards Newark. Um, and you can hopefully see that there are four different places uh, called homes on here. So there's Normanton Home right in the north there, named from Normanton on Trent. Uh, there's Grassthorpe Home, named from Grassthorpe. Um, and we have North and South Home, both next to Sutton on Trent. So a home in this particular context appears to be Riverside land. Um, and that's a pattern that actually continues through Nottinghamshire as well, along the Trent. Um, and the word seems to indicate wet meadow. So not water meadow in the sense of kind of intentionally inundated and managed land, uh, but simply land that's too waterlogged to be of any use for arable farming, but that does make great pasture land, generally speaking. Um, and just to prove it, this is Willow Home. This is in Rolston in Nottinghamshire, so just slightly upstream from Sutton and from the map that we've just seen, so similar area. Um, this photo was taken on a scorching July day, I promise. Um, it hadn't rained for days. They are not permanent pools. That's just really soggy. <laughs> so we've got an artificial embankment between the river and the land. So it's not that the river's flooded, it's just the nature of the land. It's used mainly for grazing cattle, as it happens, on this stretch. And this is pretty much how all the Nottinghamshire homes that I've been to look. This is just a great picture. And I wouldn't be at all surprised to find that that's, that's the same in, in other parts of the region as well. And this is, of course, a subtle <coughs> but quite important difference from the definition of home as found in settlement names. So in settlement names, it's used to mark these areas that are suitable for building on. They are the dry bits. In minor place names, rather than indicating where the waterlogged ground isn't, it's indicating where the waterlogged ground is. So that's giving you something of a sampler, um, looking at different kinds of Viking and Viking influence place names in the East Midlands. We've seen the evidence that patterns of settlement names can give us, and I've shown you the way that Norse words can be absorbed into English as dialect terms like Beck, uh, as influence on English place naming like Thorpe, and on the vocabulary used in minor place names as well, like these homes. Now, there are, of course, a number of different possible interpretations for many of the things that I've said for many of these naming patterns. But whichever the way you want to look at it, I think it's clear that Viking settlers and their language and their own place naming habits, in fact, have had a huge influence on the place names of the East Midlands. 
And if you want to find out more about the place names in your local area, shameless plug time, <laughs> and explore patterns and meanings, you don't even have to buy a book, okay? Not plugging my book. <laughs> I'd highly recommend that you take a look at the key to English place names. So this is a completely free online resource uh, put together by the Institute for Name Studies here at the university. Um, and it lets you search for settlement names in England, um, explore patterns of names using the same languages, the same elements, and even look for places around the country um, which bear the same name. So that's been something of a whirlwind, I think. I, I, hope, I hope you're still with me here. Um, but hopefully you're going away a bit better informed about the way that place names can actually inform our understanding of Viking settlement than when you arrived. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to spot some of these places with possible Viking heritage as you go on your own travels around the East Midlands. Thank you very much.